All right, first question, what are your top supplements for reducing inflammation markers? So inflammation, it is considered one of the main root causes of, you know, virtually all chronic diseases, including aging itself, like that there's the term called inflammaging, which refers to the age-associated increase in inflammation in the body. So, you know, not all inflammation is bad. You do benefit from some amounts of inflammation, especially when we're talking about fighting infections like a fever, you also need inflammation for muscle hypertrophy. So the you know swell cell swelling response is an inflammatory response. And if you shut down or blunt that inflammatory response with cold exposure or too many anti-inflammatory supplements after resistance training, then you also blunt some of the beneficial adaptations, these adaptations are from um, exercise. So not all inflammation is bad. The problem is that, you know, the, the amount of inflammation is uh, what's uh, bad. So in the modern world, or if you have certain, let's say, comorbidities or chronic diseases, then you might experience too much inflammation, chronic inflammation, which is one of the main hallmarks of aging as well, chronic inflammation, which contributes to inflammaging each associated increase in inflammation and uh, the subsequent increase in the chronic diseases as well. So, you know, generally the healthy lifestyle is going to reduce your inflammation as well, getting enough sleep, eating uh, like a proper diet, not overeating calories, like any food in excess can cause inflammation. So it comes down to like just energy balance and maintaining optimal body weight. But in the question of what are the certain supplements, then, you know, there are quite a wide variety of supplements that can have beneficial effects on inflammation, such as, you know, glycine and NAC. They increase glutathione, which has anti-inflammatory properties. I've talked a lot about that on the channel as well. In certain situations, magnesium can have anti-inflammatory effects. Then there's things like, you know, vitamin C, vitamin E, there, those are antioxidants. Astaxanthin has anti-inflammatory properties, even like ginger and stuff like quercetin, fisetin, apigenin, you know, they generally have some anti-inflammatory properties. Is the effect size very big from something like quercetin or fisetin? I don't think so. There's not a lot of like uh, studies uh, looking at that, but I think, you know, the most powerful and most like bang for your buck in terms of the anti-inflammatory effects are omega-3 supplements and uh, melatonin, glycine and NAC and curcumin. So I think those would be the top five like legitimate antioxidant or anti-inflammatory supplements that I would you know consider like vitamin C. Yes, it has certain anti-inflammatory properties, but it's not, you know, as powerful as something like melatonin, uh, for example. So, you know, Taking omega-3s every day is a good idea to increase your omega-3 index, which is associated with reduced risk of heart disease and mortality and Alzheimer's even. So that's a good idea to like just keep in your routine on a daily basis. Second of a melatonin, every once in a while, microdosing melatonin is also good for not only the sleep properties, but also the anti-inflammatory, antioxidant properties. So melatonin, in my opinion, is like a very powerful longevity hormone. And with age, you see a de decrease in melatonin levels. Then second of all, glycine and NAC, as well, I've talked many times, glycine is a staple in my daily diet, and uh, NAC is something I take on and off, not every day. You don't want to take NAC after a workout, because it can blunt some of the positive adaptations, same with curcumin, and uh, you know, same with some other anti-inflammatory supplements, you don't want to take those after a workout, but you can take things like, you know, omega-3s, uh, melatonin before bed, omega-3s you can take like before meals, for example, to increase the absorption. And curcumin is better to take, yeah, like on the rest days or before a workout. Next question, did you share yet to complete what to eat for optimal living? So I haven't like, yeah, really outlined in detail my, what I think is the optimal diet for longevity, first and foremost. And I think the answer depends a lot on the particular individual. And, you know, the reason I haven't done this video before is because I'm more of like an agnostic when it comes to diet and nutrition. You know, I've done many different types of diets and I've seen, you know, many uh, people doing different diets and getting great results with that. And when you look at centenarians, the people who live over 100 years old, then those people also have a pretty wide range of different diets. And uh, there's also some like not healthy components in their diets. <laughs> so a lot of the centenarians, they might, you know, eat ice cream, they might eat chocolate, they might eat, you know, some other like some cookies or something like that. So the centenarians, again, you know, they're not the perfect 
like role model for regular people because the reason why most centenarians live to 100 years old is because of their genetics let's like let's be honest about that like they smoke they drink <laughs> those kind of things so they just have a very favorable genetic profile that like protects again protects them against those kind of uh, unhealthier uh, lifestyle habits so i think that the diet the reason why we want to focus on the diet in the first place is because a particular diet is going to help you to achieve a particular uh, biomarker profile. So, you know, it has to include... Because the biomarkers at the end of the day are what matter more than the diet. <laughs> of course, there are some diets that help you to achieve the better biomarkers much easier and faster than other diets and, you know, even better results with some diets and some foods. But uh, the biomarkers are, at the end of the day, what matter the most. So, you know, some of having, like, the optimal blood markers for things like your... Fasting blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C, fasting insulin, lipids, inflammation markers, immune cells, uh, sex hormones, uh, liver enzymes, kidney function, all those things are what matter at the end of the day. <laughs> so you can, theoretically, you can achieve that with almost like any diet. There are certain principles that like are kind of a must or like very correlated with those uh, beneficial outcomes but at the end of the day that's what matters so you can achieve that with a pretty wide range of different diets and what makes a particular food unhealthy which means like not fitting that profile or healthy which means that it helps you to achieve that profile is determined by you know, many other factors besides the food, like the total energy quantity, so how many calories you're eating, how is your body composition, those things also affect the biomarkers. So the diet is just like a means to an end of having these, uh, let's say, uh, you know, perfect is a big word, but just having good biomarkers that are associated with longevity and reduced risk of chronic diseases. So you just want to fit into, okay, I want to have my biomarkers fit in this pattern that are associated with the lowest risk of diabetes, heart disease, and uh, those other kind of chronic diseases that most people uh, die to. So I think, you know, then you can try to reverse engineer your way to those biomarkers. So, you know, there's certain principles in the diet, like, you know, try to eat 80% whole foods. You don't need to be some sort of a very perfect clean diet, because like I said, there are many other factors that can affect those results. So if you are someone who is very fit and exercises regularly, then you have a lot more wiggle room, <laughs> if that makes sense. You can get a lot, you, you can get away with a lot more than someone who is completely sedentary and doesn't exercise at all, because they have a much worse metabolic health like exercise is the most powerful thing for your metabolic health like hands down it, like it can literally pretty much make up for a bad diet in the short term quite easily uh, of course in the long term you do want to have a relatively healthy diet but uh, it just goes to show that there are so many more important things than just a diet and that you can achieve longevity with a wide range of different diets so you know when you look at okinawans or J japanese people they have and Koreans, they have a very high life expectancy. Both of them have over 80 years of life expectancy, which, you know, is much higher than in the US, for example. Um, but uh, they have a very different diet from the Mediterranean region, which also has a pretty high life expectancy. So uh, that clearly shows that there are some genetic factors that can determine how healthy a diet is for you. And uh, there's just, you know, many things that uh, can contribute to the final uh, result and many different diets that can achieve that so i'm just more of like an agnostic in terms of that i don't care really what kind of a diet you follow <laughs> i don't care overall what you what kind of a diet you follow like you can choose whatever diet you follow but for me at least i don't care whatever diet it is i'm just interested in the biomarkers and i'm like reverse engineering my way from the biomarkers because those are much more important in my opinion and is much you know, like the nutritional studies are hard to do. There's a lot of confounding variables. With the biomarkers, there's a bit more certainty, I guess. Like, you know, you can make much better conclusions from the biomarkers than from the diets, I think. So with that out of the way, what I think are some of the like key principles for a healthy diet. So first off, the most important thing is energy balance. So you don't want to become overweight and obese because whatever diet you follow, if you become too heavy if you have too much body fat 
then it's going to have a negative effect on your bio biomarkers and eventually down the line it's going to shorten your life expectancy as well and have a negative effect on your longevity. So energy balance is kind of king in, in the sense and how do you know if you're in energy balance just looking at your body fat and how much you weigh? Uh, the body mass index isn't a good reliable measure but the body fat percentage generally is uh, slightly like a better one and uh, depends on w how you measure your body fat percentage you know the DEXA scan is like the gold standard the most accurate way uh, to do that but uh, with the DEXA scan the ranges can be somewhat different from when you're using it like with the calipers for example uh, but you know for men the average or the kind of optimal body fat percentage would be something around like 10 to 12 percent for women 15 to 20 percent women can get away with a lot more than men in the sense that uh, women can be even overweight and still make it to centenarian hood uh, probably because of their hormonal profile is different whereas men there's no unhealthy centenarian men like all the men who become centenarians have had to be very healthy throughout their entire or most of their life like uh, you know 90% of centenarians are women and the 10% men who reach 100 years of age those men they don't have any they have very little they're much they're in much better health than the centenarian women <laughs> because of their like the women the kind of the cardioprotective effects of estrogen for example apparently is one of the reasons why the women uh, live on average like five to eight years longer than men and also like why they're able to reach old age in not a perfect health but if you're a man then you really have to be you know be in optimal body composition and optimal biomarkers if you want to reach the age of 100 that's kind of based on the data of just how many how little or how few centenarian men <laughs> there is actually second of all not only that the body fat percentage matters but also the amount of muscle mass is relatively important so me uh, people who have slightly higher muscle mass have a longer life expectancy or they have a reduced risk of mortality especially the older you get if you're somewhere in your 20s 30s 40s then it doesn't matter that much how much muscle you have like you know you might be at a risk of obesity if you have too little muscle or some other like diabetes or metabolic syndrome but the importance of muscle really starts to show after the age of like 65 because there your age-related muscle decline starts to catch up with the person so if you have too little muscle then you can break a hip and uh, you're at a risk of sarcopenia and frailty so people who have sarcopenia low muscle mass they have a high 100 percent higher risk of uh, mortality compared to people who have uh, normal or higher amounts of muscle mass so muscle mass is important to maintain and you want to like uh, you know be ahead of the curve in your youth when you're in your 20s 30s and 40s then you want to have you know slightly higher muscle mass while still maintaining lower body fat percentage and uh, maintaining like um, let's say lower waist to hip ratio and lower waist circumference because that's a reflection of lower amounts of visceral fat if you have very high waist then it means it means you have this visceral fat around the organs which is much worse than the regular type of fat under the skin uh, so yeah like you know just having muscle obviously isn't the answer you also want to have lower body fat percentage and lower waist circumference to ensure that you're not just accumulating mass <laughs> just so have being like super bulky and super heavy and just having a bunch of muscle mass like a power lifter or the strong man that's not uh, healthy in the long term so you still want to maintain relative uh, leanness so how do you achieve the higher amounts of muscle mass you know protein is by far the most important macronutrient for that <laughs> you know the single biggest predictor of muscle mass is resistance training but eating enough protein is also quite important so you know aiming for somewhere around 0 0.8 grams per pound of uh, body weight is what peaks it like it, it um, is the maximum threshold for uh, muscle growth from protein intake so and that's like 1.6 grams per kilogram of uh, body weight you don't need more than that like in the past a lot of people have said like one gram per pound of body weight you know it doesn't matter if, if you eat more than that then you just don't build more muscle uh, but you don't have any other negative side effects either like you're just wasting that protein for energy but you don't need any more than 0 0.8 grams of pound per pound of uh, body weight actually so uh, that's what I aim for I'm getting around 130 grams of protein per day which for me is yeah like the 0 0.8 grams 
per pound of uh, body weight. And the rest of the macros and foods will just, you know, fit there. Like uh, looking at your body composition, making sure that you get the, enough of the protein and making sure that you don't gain extra body fat. That's kind of the most important part to longevity. And of course, kind of trying to eat, get at least 80% of the food as whole foods is uh, good. If you have a few, like if you have some let's say processed foods in the diet it's not going to break the bank if that makes sense as long as your biomarkers are uh, optimal so you know what matters with unhealthy foods is also the amounts so i tweeted this a few weeks ago so this hypothetical scenario you know if you eat one potato chip every day for the rest of your life it's not going to have like literally no effect on your longevity like if you just eat one potato chip every day for the rest of your life your inflammation markers aren't going to change your blood sugar your lipids aren't going to change everything else it's it's just a such a small amount that it has literally no effect on your biomarkers i'm not saying that you have to do it but i'm just giving this a hypothetical scenario but if you eat 100 potato chips every day for the rest of your life <laughs> then that's a very high likelihood that you're going to gain weight and you're also going to accumulate you know the visceral fat you're also going to have worse lipids your worse uh, inflammation markers so yes in that scenario the 100 potato chips will have a negative effect on your life expectancy so uh, it all depends on the dose and the amounts of what you eat and the same you can apply the same thinking to healthy foods let's take one egg if you eat one egg every day for the rest of life it's going to have virtually no effect on your biomarkers and your longevity if you eat 100 eggs every day for the rest of your life, you probably will have, you know, it's just a lot of calories <laughs> and you might have like some, let's say, worse biomarkers as a result of that and you might accumulate just a bit too much body fat. So any food in excess can be harmful. So you need to figure out what's the amounts of that food I can eat and how it affects my biomarkers. So if you, if you eat like 60% of your diet as ultra processed food like the average american does then it's very likely you know it's highly likely that your biomarkers are going to be messed up you're going to be overweight <laughs> but if your diet is only 10 percent ultra processed food five percent you know 20 percent, i think is the kind of limit it should generally be below 20 percent because after that 20 percent is you know i would suspect most people will start to see their biomarkers go worse and they start to gain weight but if five percent of your calories come from ultra processed food then it's very unlikely that it's going to have any like significant effect on your biomarkers. You might have a few things off off in terms of the what's the optimal range, but then you just course correct accordingly. Okay, you measure your biomarkers. Okay, oops, I'm eating too much this type of food apparently because of my biomarkers. I'm going to reduce it. Okay, the biomarkers go back to normal and uh, vice versa with the healthy foods. Okay, I'm not eating enough of this because of my low amounts of muscle mass or something like that. I'm not eating enough protein, for example. So... The biomarkers, I think, uh, what I'm trying to say is like matter at the end of the day. It's it's uh, like that's the north star that you want to look at, and then the diet itself is just you know okay the anchoring point or the means to an end of having these uh, clean uh, biomarkers. Everyone's always asking me what do I put into my protein shake. I'll tell you exactly what. It's 30 grams of whey protein, 10 grams of collagen and 1 teaspoon of raw cacao. I blend it up with water and ice cubes and it becomes incredibly creamy. Whey protein is the most bioavailable protein source in the world. Many studies have found that whey protein supplementation improves muscle growth and strength when combined with resistance training. Whey protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis 31% more than soy protein and 132% more than casein after resistance training. Whey protein also promotes glutathione production, which is the body's main antioxidant that supports immunity. The brand of whey protein I use, Nordcode, has pure organic whey from grass-fed cows from the Alps. It's the highest quality and cleanest whey protein in the world. I combine it with a Nordcode complete collagen that has added glycine, which is beneficial for joints and skin health. Nordcode also has organic raw cacao with lion's mane and chaga extracts, which improves cardiovascular health and energy. All of this for only 250 calories, over 30 
grams of protein to maximize protein synthesis and 10 grams of collagen for skin anti-aging benefits. If you're allergic to dairy, then Nordcoat also has plant-based protein powder made from pea, hemp seed, and rice protein with added MCTs and maca. You can get a 10% discount by using the code SEAM10 at livehealthy.com forward slash collections forward slash Nordcoat. Next question, too much fruits gives you diabetes. So this is a pretty interesting question. Like, you know, I think over the past 10 years or so, uh, this idea that fruit is bad for you somehow has become quite popular or it's become quite common among certain groups of uh, diet people. And uh, what is the truth? Well, when you look at the outcome data in humans, then fruit consumption isn't associated with diabetes or heart disease or mortality. It's actually the opposite. People who eat you know, five servings of fruits and vegetables, they have a lower risk of diabetes and lower risk of mortality as well. So just the claim that fruit, too much fruit or too much fructose gives you diabetes, fructose from whole fruit in this context, uh, that's just not true when you look at the actual data. Like uh, there are some like mechanistic reasons why people think that fructose is harmful for you. Like it's going to fill up your liver glycogen stores. Your liver is going to overspill fat. You're going to accumulate visceral fat. You're going to have worse uh, biomarkers. And uh, also the claim that, you know, these uh, modern fruits are just cultivated sugar bombs. It's going to spike your blood sugar very high. Well, if you look at the data of actual humans eating fruit, then that's not the case. Like it just falls flat on its face <laughs> in that sense. Um, is there, like I said, previous question, too much of anything can be bad. If you eat 100 apples a day, then probably you have high triglycerides, you might have a bit more visceral fat, you might have uh, digestive discomfort from eating 100 apples per day. Uh, you, I don't think you'll, you might have a slightly higher blood sugar as well because of the high triglycerides, but it's not obviously uh, like a realistic scenario. Like most people don't eat 100 bananas or 100 apples uh, per day. Is it like eating two pieces of apples or two apples and two bananas a day or something like that? Is it going to give you diabetes? Obviously not. The uh, the like studies indicate the opposite, that people who eat more fruit generally have less diabetes or le lower risk of diabetes. So you need to find out, okay, how does your blood sugar respond to whatever food are you eating? So the mechanism by which fructose from fruit could increase uh, the risk of diabetes would be that like i mentioned earlier you eat too much fructose the fructose fills up your liver glycogen the liver starts to overspill you have an increased level of triglycerides in the blood triglycerides are these fatty acids in the bloodstream that uh, inhibit uh, insulin production by the pancreas which then causes this mild uh, insulin resistance and your blood sugar levels stay elevated for longer what's worse than that is eating processed food <laughs> so processed food is you know does like exactly that it raises your triglycerides it lowers your insulin sensitivity it increases your visceral fat accumulation so processed food is you know it's that on steroids <laughs> for regular fruit to cause that response yes you would eat, need to eat like 20 30 pieces of fruit every day so regular fruit even if it's this modern cultiva cultivated higher uh, sugar content fruit that's not going to do it. And uh, you also need to look at the general context. So fruit has lower calories, it's more satiating than fruit juices or some other uh, you know, regular candy. So it's not going to increase your risk of diabetes just in of itself. Even like the worst, even just a Coca-Cola, regular, regular uh, sugared uh, Coca-Cola, even that isn't going to increase your risk of diabetes just in of itself. <laughs> like it also matters in the context. If you're drinking the Coke, are you also overeating other calories? Are you also sedentary? You know, it depends a lot on the person. Or like in the majority of cases, then fruit isn't going to increase the risk of diabetes. And when you look at the actual outcome data, then it does the opposite. And people who eat fruit generally have lower risk of diabetes. As long as you're not eating fruit on top of the ultra processed diet, you know, and then even then it's the ultra processed food that generally increases the risk, not the fruit, if that makes sense. Next question, please suggest the best form of collagen to consume for maximum health benefits. So when you look at the studies, then the type of collagen that is uh, shown to reverse the hallmarks of skin aging and also improve cardiometabolic risk factors, then it's uh, collagen peptides. So collagen peptides are different from gelatin powder. They're different from regular collagen powder 
and they're also different from like other protein powders. So the peptide form is what uh, has been shown to give those results. So you, if you want to be accurate and specific, then it's the collagen peptides, low molecular weight uh, collagen peptides. So because of their unique structure and uh, bioavailability and size is what uh, has been shown to give those results. Next question, does glycine cause high glucose spikes? Also, why it's not promoted widely as sugar substitute for its sweet taste and all the benefits? So first question is, uh, does glycine cause sugar spikes? Uh, no, glycine actually lowers your blood sugar response. So three grams of glycine can lower the blood sugar response by up to 30%. And the reason it does it is because it raises insulin. But in this context, obviously, insulin is very beneficial because it helps to lower the blood sugar. And insulin has gotten a pretty bad reputation over the last, you know, again, 10 years or so. But uh, insulin itself isn't bad. Insulin is what actually helps you to lower the blood sugar response. So insulin itself isn't like a problem. It's actually even some, st some studies, people who produce the most robust insulin response to an oral glucose challenge, those people have the lowest risk of diabetes after in, in, in a, like a few years follow-up. So actually producing a lot of insulin in response to a glucose challenge or eating some uh, carbohydrates is actually a good thing because it means your body is insulin sensitive, your pancreas is producing enough insulin and that helps to lower your blood sugar. If your body doesn't produce the insulin, that's a sign of insulin resistance and uh, not being uh, glucose tolerant enough. So I think many people just focus on the insulin i'm not I'm, I'm afraid of spiking my insulin well the worst the much worse scenario is not producing insulin if that makes sense and the glycine does raise insulin which then lowers the blood sugar response as well and of course glycine has all many other health benefits uh, glutathione collagen synthesis creatine synthesis anti-inflammatory and uh, stuff like that which i've talked uh, many times and the second part of the question is why isn't it recommended as a sugar substitute I guess it's uh, a bit more expensive than stuff like stevia or sucralose or or monk fruit or whatever your type of sweetener is. It's a little bit uh, more expensive, but it's certainly, in my opinion, a lot healthier than most of the other artificial sweeteners uh, out there. And, uh, you know, like, uh, like I've said in some of my videos, I'm aiming for at least 10 grams of glycine per day <laughs> as, a sub as a supplement. So I'm, um, yeah, pretty pretty um, like uh, deliberately adding it to like teas coffees into my yogurt or stuff like that so i'm using it as a sugar substitute uh, quite quite a lot next question quinoa spinach good for muscle or increasing testosterone because of high ectosterone so ectosterone it's this uh, insect steroid hormone <laughs> which is used as a supplement it's uh you know, said to have muscle growth benefits. It's a like it's more similar to like the turkesterone, which has been popular for a few years, and the ectosterone is like a form of that. It's kind of this yeah insect steroid, and you get it from some foods as well, such as yeah spinach, quinoa, buckwheat, and some other like uh, vegetable foods. Now, is eating those foods gonna give you enough of the ectosterone to have an effect? <laughs> Probably not. You would need to like consume, you know too much let's put it that way like you would need to consume several kilograms of those foods to get any meaningful amount of the ectosterone and even then the research about the ectosterone having muscle growth benefits is also uh, somewhat limited with torquesterone the kind of main consensus is that it doesn't provide any like additional benefits uh, compared to even like creatine or something like that it's not better than creatine and the same applies to ectosterone i think uh there's not any evidence that it would support muscle growth. I have used turkesterone and ectosterone myself in the past, you know, at least based from my own placebo experience, uh, turkesterone did help with strength, not the muscle mass, but strength. It certainly helped with, like, I was a little bit stronger when I was taking turkesterone. And the same with ectosterone as well. Like, uh, the strength did increase slightly, but, uh, you know, that was like 5%, five, 6% five, increase but it didn't improve my muscle mass. So yeah, like your, you know, spin, sp spinach and quinoa, they're fine to eat, but uh, you're not really getting <laughs> a sufficient amount of uh, ectosterone uh, from those foods. And there's also like another compound, phosphatidic acid, that increases mTOR expression, and uh, mTOR is the main master switch for muscle growth. You also get uh, phosphatidic acid from cabbage, <laughs> but, you know, to eat, how much cabbage you would need to eat 
to reach any meaningful amount of that uh, phosphatidic, phosphatidic acid, then it's going to be like, you know, 20, 25 kilograms of cabbage or something that, you know, it's a good, healthy food to eat. Like sauerkraut is amazing. Uh, different kinds of salads or these uh, fermented dishes with uh, cabbage is great. You know, it's a healthy food. But uh, yeah, like trying to get ectosterone or uh, phosphatidic acid from those foods, that shouldn't be like the main reason you eat them <laughs> because it's going to be, uh, let's say, um, futile to try to get uh, any meaningful amounts uh, from them. Next question. Matt Walker said in the guest series on Huberman podcast about sleep that it's rather individual how long before bed one should stop eating. How general can the advice be given? One should stop eating X hours before bed. What's your take on this? I do think that there's a lot of individuality in this. So I feel better if I stop eating, you know, four hours before bed. I've, tr- I've, tr- I've tried, you know, eating two hours before bed as well. I sleep worse because I eat like a larger dinner. So having too much food in my stomach two hours before bed does reduce my sleep quality. And uh, if I stop eating at least four hours before bed, then I sleep better. Some people might feel better if they stop eating like eight to ten hours before bed. You know, that's fine. I think you would get deeper sleep, uh, honestly speaking, because your stomach is empty and you're in like a semi-faster state. You go into this uh, deep sleep a bit faster, I think, I would presume, because of spending less time on digestion. Whereas if you eat like an hour before bed, a very large meal, you might feel fine but your body is still digesting a lot of the food, so you might not get that deep of a sleep. So, but, you know, again, it depends on the person and uh, how do they feel. And, you know, of course, tracking it with a sleep tracker like the Oaring or some other uh, monitor so that you can see, okay, how, um, how much deep sleep or REM sleep am I getting? What I've noticed is that I'm getting deep sleep fine even if I eat late, but my REM sleep is lower if I eat too late. So that's what I've just uh, noticed. You want idea to get both... REM and deep sleep in uh, sufficient amounts. So you just need to yeah, like experiment. Generally, I think uh, a good rule of thumb is to stop eating at least, you know, four hours before bed. But uh, some people get too hungry. So if that's so, then just have a, like a smaller snack, uh, some cottage cheese or yogurt with some berries. That's a nice low glycemic, high protein, satiating snack that uh, doesn't fill you up too much. But it also has, you know, the protein and calcium and those kind of things that help with uh, the sleep stages as well. So, yeah, just kind of experiment a little bit. Next question. Do you have any tips on how to offset caffeine effects if I accidentally drink it during nighttime and having trouble sleeping? So, yeah, caffeine has a pretty long half-life. It's like 5.8 or 5.6 hours, something like that, like almost six hours, the (laughs) half-life. So, you know, if you drink caffeine... At 12 p.m., then uh, 50% of it's still going to be in your system at 6 p.m. So that's a big, you know, reason why caffeine has a negative effect on your sleep. If you drink it any time af- in the afternoon, then it can have, let's say, uh, it's going to reduce your sleep uh, quality even if you don't notice it. So it's going to be about like 10% reduced sleep quality on, on average, even if you drink it relatively early so is there a way to offset that yes so if you have this genetic if you're genetically a fast metabolizer of caffeine then um, those individuals can get away with eating or consuming caffeine pretty late like i'm a fast metabolizer i can drink coffee even for dinner uh for at 6 p.m and then i'll still be able to fall asleep it might be a bit worse quality but i'll be still able to fall asleep Whereas some people, the slow metabolizers, if they drink coffee even at 10 a.m., they might notice a hard time falling asleep in the evening. So first of all, know your like caffeine metabolism. And uh, second of all, there are certain foods that help to clear out caffeine faster. So vitamin C is a good one for that. And uh, the carotenoids as well. So like carrots, tubers, those kind of things help with uh, clearing out caffeine. So in the evening, I usually what I've done recently, because I've been writing a book, I've been like consuming a bit more caffeine than usual. So over the past you know six months or so, I've been just uh, caffeinating a little bit more <laughs> than uh, previously. So what I've done is just eaten a, like an orange after dinner. So the vitamin C in the orange, it makes me a bit more sleepy. And the, the vitamin C uh, pretty much helps to clear out the caffeine uh, faster. And like I said, the carrots, tubers, they can have the same effect. So this is one hack you can try in the evening if you're feeling a bit 
like wired up or too energetic, uh, that can do it. But second of all, you need to build your sleep drive or sleep pressure. So this is the feeling that you want to fall asleep. So if you're super tired, you've been up 24 hours, <laughs> then you feel the sleep pressure is pretty heavy. Like you can just lay down and fall asleep almost anywhere. So how do you increase the sleep pressure and sleep drive? Physical exercise and activity, sunlight exposure, and uh, you know food intake at uh, appropriate times as well. So the more physical activity you do, the greater your sleep pressure is. So doing a workout during the daytime is going to be very beneficial for sleep. Like the studies find that the more you exercise, the better sleep quality it is, uh, pretty much. And uh, the same way with uh, vitamin D and sunlight exposure. If you're exposed to a lot of natural sunlight during the day, that also increases sleep pressure and sleep de demand. And it also produces, helps you to produce melatonin in the evening. So uh, yeah, getting a lot of, you know, ideal scenario is even if you drink coffee in the morning or in the noon, just go outside, do a workout and uh, even taking a sauna or something, that's also going to make you more tired and that's going to help you to pretty much increase your sleep pressure and uh, clear out the caffeine uh, from your bloodstream faster. Next question, what do you think of a T-score of 2.1? And if low, how can I increment that number? So the T-score is used to reflect your bone density. If you do a DEXA scan, then they're going to scan you and give you a T-score and a Z-score. They're pretty very similar, but uh, pretty much a higher T or Z score means that your bone density is, you know, a few standard deviations above normal. So having a T or Z score of zero is like normal for your age group. Plus one is one standard deviation above normal. Plus two, two standard deviations above normal. Minus one is, you know, below standard deviation. Minus two, so that's minus two is going to be some some of the range of the osteopenia and osteoporosis so the lower the number in the minuses the worse the higher the better so 2.1 is uh, excellent so it's two standard deviations above normal for your age group i also measured my bone density in november for the t-score i got 2.9 in my spine and the z-score was 3.0 which is yeah three standard deviations above normal for my age group of 29 year olds so as you can see it's pretty maxed out in terms of the bone density for my age group and uh, the score the bone density is going to decrease with age on average so if you stay three or you know two standard deviations above normal all throughout your life then you have a pretty good high bone density i measured my hips as well so my hips are less dense if that makes sense and uh, the the score for this was uh, 0 0.5 for t and z score so I'm only 0 0.5 standard deviations above normal, which is still, you know, great. Like it's, you know, 0 0.5 standard deviations above normal, but it's not as high as my spine, obviously. And uh, I think the reason for that might be because I'm overloading my spine with almost like every exercise that I do. Like I do a lot of, even if I do squats, my spine gets a lot of stimulation from the heavier weights. The deadlifts tra uh, train the spine the uh, even the bench press can train the spine to a certain extent and pull-ups and all those things train the spine and, or, or like stimulate bone density in those whereas with the hip bones the femur then uh, that only gets trained when i'm doing squats obviously i train squats pretty regularly but uh, i'm going to like tr change some of the way i do it i'm going to try to uh, squat a lot deeper i'm going to try to train like these ass to grass uh, squats pretty much of going full depth and with heavier loads i'm gonna have to reduce the weights but i'm gonna just go deeper just to hit the femur bones a lot more and uh, the mechanical tension and mechanical overload is the biggest determinant of bone density of course you need adequate protein intake as well and calcium and magnesium and vitamin d etc but uh, the resistance training is the biggest contributor to bone density and increasing the T and Z score. So yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to keep doing obviously the heavy loads on the spine, but I'm going to uh, change my squats to the very deep uh, kind of ass to grass form of squats with heavier loads. And I'll see if that's going to increase my hip bone density as well. Next question, a lot of quality meat fish are packed in plastics. Is this a problem? So uh, recently I talked about a study where they looked at the commercial proteins sold in supermarkets. They looked at fish, meats, 
these uh, Beyond Burgers and those things as well. And they found that virtually all of them had microplastics in them. So uh, even the regular red meat, regular fish, unprocessed fish and those kind of things, they all had microplastics in them. And uh, the authors of the study concluded that, that the Americans are consuming millions of microplastics from protein alone per year. <laughs> so this is obviously worrisome, especially in light of the uh, another recent study where they found that the microplastics accumulated in the arterial plaque of people. So I think uh, this goes to show how prevalent microplastics are in our lives. You know, is it, I mean, you can't really avoid all of them, <laughs> even if you, yeah, like not drink from plastic bottle, bottles, you don't use any um, microplastic containing uh, skincare or those kind of things. Even then, you might get the microplastics from the protein that you eat and you obviously need protein to live so you know what i'm thinking about is that you just minimize your exposure to microplastics from everywhere everywhere else where you can don't drink from plastic bottles uh, don't use the plastic tupperware get the glass uh, kind of containers get glass bottles and those kind of things uh you know try to not use any these uh, regular skincare products that have microplastics and those kind of things. So it's it's a pretty, let's say, very hard task to avoid them completely <laughs> because even then, like, you're going to get exposed in some shape or form. Should you be worried about the protein side? You know, like I said, you can't avoid protein. You need protein to live. It's like, like the only macronutrient needed for survival. You can, yes, like, go to the butcher directly and get, like, your pieces of meat from there or if you have a fisherman get the fish fresh from them from the net <laughs> like that and uh, some of the other let's say packaged proteins uh, generally contain some microplastics and you know even like you can if you have like the actual dry beans so the dry beans in some sort of a container like uh, because if it's if it's dry then it doesn't leach the microplastics so if, if the if the product is wet so like meat is moist if it's inside a plastic container so that's why it leaches into uh, the product so if if the container is or if the product is dry like dry beans or dry legumes or whatever then it doesn't have any microplastics and the same with like the meat if it's if it's wrapped in uh, paper or something like that then uh, it uh, shouldn't have the microplastics uh, either next question is vitamin a equal to cord liver oil so cord liver oil contains vitamin a you know, it's hard to say if it's equal to that because, you know, I don't know what it means, if that, if that makes sense. Like, you know, you, you can get vitamin A from quite a few different foods, liver, cold liver oil, uh, sweet potatoes, carrots, so to say. So is it equal to cold liver oil? Well, you get a lot of other things from cold liver oil as well, some some omega-3s and some other vitamins, uh, vitamin D as well. So it's a good source. It's a, like, I, th I think it's a pretty good source of omega-3s and vitamin A and vitamin D. And uh, I think vitamin A supplements otherwise aren't like a good idea. It's better to get uh, the vitamin A from food, uh, such as cord liver oil. Uh, but you have to be kind of double checking the source of the cord liver oil. And uh, like liver is also high in vitamin A and uh, other foods like uh, carrots and uh, potatoes. They have like the plant form, which isn't as bioavailable, but uh, it's, you know, carotenoids themselves are individually uh, associated with lower risk of mortality, lower rates of neurodegeneration, lower rates of uh, cardiovascular disease. So the carotenoids you get that you get from uh, sweet potatoes, carrots, and some other this uh, squash and uh, salmon and those kind of things, those are associated with uh, better health as well. So you you know you want to eat those anyway, in my opinion. All right, that's it for this Q and A. Make sure you click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.